Hi guys, and I'm so happy you're here with me today. Today I thought I'll talk a little bit about marriage, and that's just because on the 4th of September, Sam and I celebrated 12 years of marriage. Yay! Uh, for some of you, it might be a lot. For some of you, it might be, oh, so little. Oh, they are so kiddies. We are like 30 years old. We have 40 years or 20 or 50. We don't have a lot. Oh, we don't have too little, so I, because I was, not always, but recently I've been more and more uh, open and I wanted like, Lord, I want you to, to help other people through my journey, even if I didn't reach the, the level I'm supposed to yet. It's the same with the marriage. Uh, I'm going to try and give some advices for marriage in this video and I hope you take it um, how I want it to be taken. It's not like advices from somebody who says, oh, I reached the perfection, I have nothing to work on anymore in my marriage, Sam and I are perfect, life is perfect, we've got everything sorted out. It's not. It's just some things that we learned, some things that we saw were good, some things that we learned from other people, and we applied it to our marriage and we saw how great it is. And we just want you to have a great marriage as well. As I said, we've been married for 12 years, I love some more now than I do at the, than I did at the beginning. It's different. It's like um, it's like a good wine. <laughs> the more the time passes, the better it gets. That's how I feel our marriage has been. We did have our ups and lows. We did have our hard problems, whether they were in a marriage or from the outside. We had issues to deal through, but. We always did it together, hand in hand, and our hands in God's hands. And we managed to pull through. We got on the other side wiser, more mature, and more in love. So I hope you take my advices from this heart. And know somebody has it all planned out or figured out, we are perfect, and we're coming to teach you now. We just thought we would share as, as if we were having a cup of tea or coffee or a lemonade because it's too hot and just chat a little bit about marriage together. It will be the same things I will tell you or that we would tell you. So what are some of these advices? It's not necessarily in the order I will tell you, but I actually lost my agenda, <laughs> uh, FYI, and I can't find it. It's obviously somewhere in the house, but you see how perfect life is. <laughs> Sometimes we lose our stuff and we can't find them, although they're in the house. And that's not just because it's a mess, I just can't seem to find it right now. But I'll tell these advices as I remember them. I'll start with this advice, which I heard it at Craig Rochelle. Craig Rochelle is an American pastor and he's a great guy. Um, and I've learned a lot from his messages. I will leave the, down, the link down below too. He has like a full part series message, which is really good on marriage. And he touches some of the points I'll talk about today. Some of, like this point, I took it with this wording from him, but we kind of applied it since before we got married. And this advice is, it's keep God number one always. And keep your wife or your husband your number two. Normally say, I want my husband or I want my wife to be number one. No, I never want to be number one in Sam's life. I want God to be number one and I'll be more than glad to be number two. When you keep God first, eventually, it doesn't happen overnight, it's not magic. When you keep God number one in your life, eventually things will fall into place. So work always on keeping God number one and your partner number two. Another principle that we applied since, <laughs> or actually, let me start like this. Uh, I actually wrote a blog post about this and Many times in churches or conferences, you hear this question, oh, I want to see the hands of those people, that, that, that couple that never had a fight, and that married couple that never had a fight. And so many times he's like, not properly lifting his arms up because he doesn't want to be called in the front, but uh, like always telling me, I'm one of those, we are one of those. So if you ask Sam, he will tell you that we never fought, we never had a fight. If you ask me, I keep telling Sam that that puts people, sends people the wrong idea and he's like no, because fight is a fight, argument or conflict is a different thing. 
So I would say that we fought, but we fought fair, we fought wise. So it depends who you ask. But if you understand through a fight, what well, majority of the people will understand through a fight, which is when you start talking, she starts talking, you both start talking, and keep uh, from a little thing like this gets a bigger thing like this. You shout, she shouts. Um, you throw words that you maybe don't want to throw, she throws words that maybe she doesn't throw, and then eventually one of you has to come and say, I'm sorry, and make peace. If that's what you understand through a fight, then yes, we never fought in 12 years of marriage. We did have conflicts, we did have arguments, we did have things to sort through, issues to solve, uh, problems where we had to find a solution. Yes, we had that. But we always chose to discuss about it, uh, we never just blab on about it, we never turned it into an escalated conflict, we just talked about it and tried to solve it in a more calm way. I know that our temperament helps us in this sense, but Sam and I, we are not explosive people, we are not very extrovert people, so that helps us as well, but no matter what, no matter how um, explosive or how you just have to say it and then get it off your heart and then you are fine with the situation, no matter how extrovert you are, your temperament can never be used in a real way as an excuse. Just think about it. Can you go in front of God and say, you know, I kept shouting on my husband and being disrespectful and kept throwing words around just because I'm very extrovert. Just think about the how how silly it is if you think about it in a bigger picture. It's fine if you're in your family and you're in your marriage, you wanna treat things and solve things not so calmly. That's okay. But no matter how um, your temperament is no matter how you choose to sort conflicts in your marriage just remember learn to fight fair learn to treat a conflict in a fair play way and uh, there's no excuse just think about it when you have a conflict with your husband he's not just your husband he's not just the father of your kids He's not just the son of his uh, of your mother-in-law and your father-in-law. He's also, especially as Christians, yeah, he's also a son of God. So think about it in the way you treat your husband. You as a man, think about it. When you have to solve an issue, you're not just solving that issue with your wife or with the mother of your kids or with um, the daughter of your mother-in-law and father-in-law. You're also dealing with a daughter of God. Keep that in mind. I think if we are to keep that in mind at all times, then some things will change. I think a lot of marriages were to change. Christian marriages we're talking about now. If we were to keep that in mind. So, no matter how you choose, because okay, maybe it's just our choice, our preference to have a more, more calm atmosphere and uh, talk about issues and sort them in a more calmly way. Maybe you don't want it this way, maybe you're fine with it being a bit more hype. The idea is learn to fight fair. Learn, and now I'm gonna go to the next advice. Learn not to attack the person, but address the issue. It's one of the advices that we learned before we got married. We only had one fight in our lifetime together, and that was before we got married. I can't even remember what it came it started from, but it escalated into a big thing where Sam I remember him we were at the Bible college, he was so annoyed and he doesn't get easily annoyed. Uh, and so upset and he doesn't get easily upset that he just got out of the room. We we're in a, obviously in a public space, in a public room at school, and he just he had to let the steam go off and in about five minutes he was I don't know how many kilometers away he needed to just run and let the steam off and I said okay I never want to see him like that again and from there we learn how to address an issue without attacking the person and I'm, that's part of playing fair that's part of 
fighting fear. I'm gonna give you some advices, uh, some examples. Imagine he comes home, he puts, he takes his shoes off, throws his socks on the floor and goes and sits on the couch. And that drives you nuts. Now, most of them wives, if this would be an issue, will start saying, but you always leave your socks on the floor. It drives me nuts when I see you dropping your dirty, smelly socks on the floor. Well, not smelly socks, but just drops them on the floor. Then it just takes two more steps to put them in the dirty clothes basket, and on and on you go, you always do like this, you never respect me, la 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 la. And from there he feels attack, because you're just attacking him. He's probably thinking, uh, actually, it's not true. I don't always do that. Last Sunday, actually, put him in the dirty clothes basket, and you're just gonna find him ironic, and then you're just gonna escalate it even more. But you are attacking the person, or he might say to you, or to his wife, you know, you don't respect me in this marriage. Every time we go to home group, you keep praising that leader, you keep praising that pastor. But you always put me down, you always just give me as bad examples, uh, you always do this, you never respect me in public. And then from then on she feels attacked and she's gonna attack back and he is just gonna go back and forth, back and forth, like playing this circle of just attacking each other. Learn to attack the issue, not the problem. Now imagine a different scenario, same scenario but a different way of exposing the thing. He comes home from work, does the usual thing, takes his shoes off, throws his socks all over the floor and goes and sits on the couch. And you go, maybe not then because he's super tired, but maybe after he had dinner, he washed himself up, had dinner, he's more relaxed, a bit more energized and you go and say, look, love, I know you're tired every day you come from work and I appreciate how much you are working to provide for our family and I really respect that but you know I just want to talk to you a little bit every time you come home and you leave the socks I know you don't leave them every time but every time you leave them on the floor and you just go and sit on the couch I feel so disrespected I feel like you don't really appreciate my work that I do and I know I don't have a proper job but you know it does take a lot of effort to take care of the kids and of the house and I already have to collect so many times the toys and the pillows and you know just uh, getting the stuff organized after our kids and I try to keep the house clean I try to tidy up about half an hour before you come home but it's just I know you're tired but maybe we can find a solution because it just really makes me uh, puts me down every time it makes me feel so disrespected so unappreciated now imagine that how would do you think your husband would react to that comment rather than you always leave the sock on the floor you never respect me how do you think the difference well let's put it the other way around instead of you coming to your wife and saying you know you never respect me every time we go to hungry you keep praising that pastor you keep praising that leader but you never have a good word about me you always give me in bad examples and you don't know how badly that makes me feel and uh, you always you always if he was to come and say, you look babe, you know I want to talk to you about something. Again, choose your moments wisely. Uh, you know, I really love how you're trying to encourage and praise everybody. I really appreciate how at every home group meeting, you're always praising our pastor and we need more people like you. But you know, I know that sometimes you gave me an example in, in, as a bad example. And every time that happens, it just really makes me feel like so low. It makes me feel like I'm such a bad father or such a bad husband or such a bad man. I know you don't mean it in a bad way. I know you're just trying to encourage and help other people. But you know, every time that happens, it really makes me feel really unrespected. Now, how do you think your wife would react to that? Just think a little bit about it. This um, learning doesn't happen naturally, it didn't come naturally to us. And again I'll say, nothing good will grow by itself on this earth. If you leave an apple outside for 3, 4, 5 months, depending on the if it's in the summer just for a month, it will not be better after that time, it will just get worse, it will just become inedible. 
it would just disintegrate because everything left on this earth by itself it will disintegrate it will go into worse and worse and worse if you want to have something good on this earth you have to work for it you have to invest in it you have to be intentional about it so learn there's a lot of studies a lot of good books learn how to attack the issue not the person and that's available especially for marriage but for basically any human relationship learn to attack and address the issue not attack the person and now I'll come to another advice that we took it from the beginning of our marriage which is that we never and I'm saying with capital highlighted colors this word never use the word never and always in our marriage especially when it comes to a negative context you never do this you always do this we just to never use these two words uh, I'm pretty sure we managed to do it up to 99 for 99 percent of the time maybe we had I don't know an on off uh, where we probably used it but it was a choice it was something we work on and even if we have a conflict we are very aware of this rule that we put for our family, for our marriage, that we'll never use these two words. Never and always. I'll get to the next point, which is educate yourself. Invest in educating yourself. Invest in becoming a better version. We had the blessing, Sam and I, we had the blessing of meeting in a Bible college, being in the same year at the Bible college, growing spiritually in character together. We also had the privilege and the blessing of having premarital counseling with an amazing couple. Thank you, Eliana and Johnny. Uh, thank you for taking the time to invest in us. You have no idea how much those meetings helped us start on the right foot in our marriage. And uh, having the marriage we have today, it's also partially because of you guys investing the time in us. So thank you so much. Um, we had premarital counseling we read books i mean sam he uh after we were serious about our relationship we knew we we're gonna get married he started reading every book he could find on marriage whether it was a well-known author or a very nobody heard about him author we had a very good and biggish library at the bible college and he read every marriage book every relationship book that he could put his hands on I appreciate you babe for this and I respect you and uh, I would recommend any man to do this especially men because women tend to read a bit more than men do at least in Romanian culture maybe it's not the same where you live but invest educate yourself yourselves learn how to do those things it's a it's about learning how to address the issue without attacking the person it doesn't happen you have to learn this educate just think about it how many hours did you invest or are you investing if you're getting uh, ready to get married now for the wedding day the wedding day yes it's important it's a special moment it's a special memory but how much money energy time you invest so that every little detail is perfect so that the flowers stay the perfect way so that the uh, candle lit the proper way so it doesn't go that way the flame goes this way like from all the details and how little number of couples actually invest in, in getting ready for the marriage which lasts or it should last a lifetime invest educate yourself if you're engaged now use this time use this time not just to get the wedding ready but use this time to get ready for marriage read 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 educate ask ask other people other couples how do you do this how do you do that most of them they are more than willing to help and share of the wisdom they have educate yourself i'll go to another point uh, remember that any baggage that you don't sort out before marriage you're going to bring it into ma in marriage with you uh, whether it's pornography marriage doesn't sort out your addiction to pornography and if you're already married, you know this. And you have this issue, you know this. Sort your issues before you get married. 
if you're married and you are, I'm, I'm just giving you this example about pornography. If you're married and you or your husband or your wife is addicted to pornography, there is hope. There is hope. God can still set you free. You just have to want it. Be willing to work for it. Sometimes it happens like this and God delivers people and frees them instantly from this lust and from the, um, the desire to consume pornography. Sometimes it's a process and sometimes you actually have to work for it. You have to be accountable, you have to find somebody, a man if you're a man, a woman if you're a woman, and uh, be accountable to have, meet, talk about it, but it's possible. One of those guys that we look up to and we learn from their marriage is John and Lisa Bivier. He actually talks about the subject, how he entered marriage, served in a church, was addicted to pornography and how God set him free. So if it's your case that you already entered the marriage with this baggage, there is hope for you. Remember, any baggage that you don't sort out before marriage, whether it's addictions, all sorts of addictions, whether it's um, past relationships that maybe you didn't break off in your heart, any trauma that's not sorted before marriage, you're going to bring it into marriage with you. I'm going to go through a few advices pretty quick because they are very self-explanatory. Always choose to believe the best in your spouse. Everybody's innocent until proven guilty, but I would go, this is like the next step. I choose, I willingly choose to believe the best in my husband. No matter the situation. And okay, give him the chance. Give him the chance to explain. Give him, give him the chance to repent if it's the, the situation. But I always choose to believe the best in my husband. I'm learning that now to extend it to other people. And I'm slowly learning uh, and choosing to believe the best in people. Even if we live in a fallen world. Even if the society is as bad as it is. It's just um, a, um, a choice and a decision that I make, made to always choose to believe the best first in me. On to the next issue. Quick, fast, I won't go too much into it. Divorce is an option when you make it an option. And I think with that I said everything I had to say. I know there are all sorts of situations. I know there are all sorts of marriages, delicate marriages, where there's all sorts of particularities but I took this for my marriage Sam and I took this for our marriage divorce will become an option when we're gonna make it an option I won't talk about the older other special cases um, that's it about divorce divorce is a very vast subject and it's not the time now to talk about it but what we took for our marriage and I recommend you take it for your marriage divorce is a, an option when you make it an option I'm saying this because many couples, or few couples, or a herd of couples, <laughs> that when they fight, when they have a conflict, they easily throw this word out to divorce. Sam and I chose to willingly not make a divorce option, an option, or divorce is an option when you make it an option. Remember that. The next advice, pray for each other and pray together. Pray for your husband, pray for your wife, and pray together. Sam and I, we didn't get to the spiritual level and maybe we'll never get there, I don't know. It's not necessarily something that I'm necessarily with. It's a goal for us to have all these long spiritual prayers together. Sometimes maybe it will happen. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, our praying together time is very fast, very simple. Just God, please bless Sam today. Give him energy for work. Sam says, oh God, please bless Alex. Give her patience with the kids at school. Very simple, but we do pray together. Make it a priority. Pray for each other and pray together. I think these are all the advices. I hope I didn't get anything, but not having my agenda right here doesn't help me be very organized in my thoughts. But those are some of the advices that I would give somebody who's getting married just in the desire if you want a happy marriage that's the way to get there yeah it takes a lot of work uh, is it worth it 100% and um, when I thought about recording this video I asked Sam what would he add if he was to say something to you guys and he just said one thing besides everything that I said he said uh, just tell them this thing an advice for me would be instead of working on changing your partner 
through changing your husband or your wife to become the ideal you created in your head. Work on yourself, on becoming better you as a person. Sam always worked on himself. He is a great dad, an amazing husband, a godly man that I respect very much. But recently he went into even more uh, precise, very more uh, intended, <laughs> I don't even know how to, I can't find the word right now, uh, to work on himself. He has a small agenda, he always has it in his pocket, he's with the highlighters, he always writes, Just that's just the way he functions. He has to write if he prayed, if he encouraged his kids today, if he, um, I don't know, if he did his work for today, his workout for today, <clears throat> or whatever. That's just the way he functions. I wouldn't necessarily function that way. But basically his advice stands, and I'll paraphrase it, maybe it's not with the exact words, but it's don't work on changing your husband or your wife into the ideal you created in your head, but work on yourself, on you becoming better. That sounds as wise, and I'll probably end up with that, and the video with that. We always say, Sam and I, your marriage can be a shack or it can be a palace. It depends on you. Your marriage will be as good as you, both of you, make it be. It's up to you guys. Uh, it doesn't happen naturally, it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time, it takes intentionality, it takes energy. Is it worth it? 100%. I know the best is yet to come in our marriage too and I hope in 10 years time or in 12 years time when I look back I'll be like now it's even better than it was 12 years ago because that means we grew, that means we developed, that means we mature. Be blessed, <clears throat> I'll see you next time and I pray God's blessing over your marriage. See you next time guys, bye!